So good afternoon, everybody. And um, this is uh, such a treat to be able to welcome Professor Tang from UCLA to come talk to both our students as well as to folks I think that's not um, right. who are here as part of our Yeah. IPA I just don't know if they're allowed to like, prescribe you anything. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome her and uh, I'm going to just remind everybody to turn your videos and mics off unless you are uh, speaking so that we can focus on what's going on. Uh, also, there is going to be CLE for this event. So if you want CLE, uh, you should hear from Robin, my colleague, and she'll give you further information on how to get CLE. Uh, by email. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to hand this one over to Llewellyn and Arita to introduce uh, Professor Tang. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off. Um, thank you so much for coming here and talking to us. So um, Professor Zine Tang received her BA in English Literature and Creative Writing, summa cum laude from Columbia University. She went on to receive her JD from Yale Law School in 2012, where she received the Neil M. Albert Prize for Best Paper on Art Law and twice received the Nathan Burkan uh, Memorial Prize for Best Paper on Copyright Law. During law school, Professor Tang served as editor-in-chief of the Yale Journal of Law and Technology. In 2020, Professor Tang uh, joined UCLA School of Law as an assistant professor of law teaching courses on topics such as entertainment law and intellectual property. And then Llewellyn will say yeah. the rest. Uh, so prior to joining the staff, Professor Tang served as a lead counsel on music licensing for Facebook and an associate of intellectual property with several groups. She worked on a variety of transactional and litigation matters in the technology, media, and entertainment sectors. Professor Tang has an extensive list of scholarship and research focused on the role, sorry, on the roles that technological evolution and new modes of dissemination play in the law of intellectual property. Her most recent publication, The Class Action as Licensing and Reform Device, presents an in-depth look at copyright class actions, offering a view of the class action device as both an efficient legal coordinating mechanism and in making substantive copyright law. Professor Tang finds class actions to be part of the future and the promise of licensing and reform by litigation. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us here. We're really excited to hear you talk. Thank you. And the, the proper view is the speaker view, so you can actually see uh, and focus on Professor Tang. So I'm going to remove the spotlight from Llewellyn and Raisa. So, and please turn your, your videos off. I'm going to now invite Professor Tang to say a few words before we get into the Q&A section. So Professor Tang, over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you so much, Professor Lim, for having me here with you all today. Um, so I know the paper was very long. So I understand if um, some of the other folks who've joined uh, this fireside chat didn't get the chance to read the entire thing. So I'm going to quickly just give an overview of um, you know, how this project came to be and what I believe some of the key takeaways should be. So this project sets out to examine two subjects that I think are not often put in conversation with one another, which is copyright law on the one hand and class actions on the other. So um, my interest in this subject began uh, when I was in private practice. Actually. So we had been working on a settlement to a class action that had been filed against our client Spotify, um, the streaming service, by a class of songwriters. And we had wanted to use a settlement in a class action that had been filed against Google Books, which is um, um, the book scanning service offered by Google, as a model for our own settlement. And so in my view, that Google Books settlement was innovative not for its monetary components, right, the payout that it actually gave to class members, but instead for its non-monetary components, provisions that attempted to solve for longstanding data problems in the book publishing industry that had led to a record number of orphan works or works for which the owner could not be located. 
The only problem we, representing Spotify, faced was that the Google Books settlement had been rejected precisely because of these non-monetary provisions. And so in his decision denying the proposed settlement, which ultimately would have given Google the ability to scan millions of books and monetize them, Judge Chin, who oversaw the settlement, noted that the settlement's non-monetary provisions, including its establishment of a book rights registry, which attempted to address the orphan works problem by being the first to track ownership data for books and pay out on them, was, he noted, quote, a matter more suited for Congress than this court. So at the time, I think many agreed with Judge Chin that the settlement should have been rejected, in large part because of its quasi-legislative nature. But I became interested in previous settlements and copyright class actions and in the use of the class action mechanism in copyright litigation more generally. I wondered, was the Google Books class action some new innovation, or had there been a number of class actions filed in the copyright context before that? Were settlements in these class actions more likely to be approved than not? Were they structured in ways that the Google Books Court had rejected, with blanket licenses for past harms, with forward-looking royalties, and with, importantly, I think, non-monetary provisions that had quasi-legislative effect? So my research, which dated back to the adoption of Rule 23 in 1938, revealed a true paucity of lawsuits that had been styled as a class action in the years leading up to the technological revolution in 1990. So in the decades, um, in five decades leading up to the 1990s, from 1938 to 1990, there were only roughly about 10 such suits styled as a class action. And a lot of these involved classes of plaintiffs that were already all members of um, collective rights organizations like ASCAP, which is a performing rights organization that has um, hundreds of thousands of songwriter members. So I think in that period from 1938 to 1990, what you saw was class actions being used in this kind of unremarkable way in which um, natural classes, right, all members of ASCAP would go ahead and sue um, as a class. But then stuff started to get really interesting in the 1990s. So in the time period from 1990 to 2000, one decade, 22 class actions were filed. This isn't terribly um, large in, in a quantitative sense, but it's actually large when you compare it to the five decades prior, right, which, in which there had only been 10 or so in, in 50 years. So I think this development's extremely interesting given that new digital technologies, right, new modes of disseminating content picked up around exactly the same time. So as the paper discusses, many of the class actions that were filed in this time period and the ensuing settlements attempted to address new questions for copyright law that digital technologies posed. And so I talk about um, a few of these in depth in my paper. One particularly interesting example is uh, one that was um, filed by a class of music publishers who had sued the tape manufacturer Sony, um, arguing that uh, Sony was engaging in uh, mass copyright infringement by making it easy for users to tape songs onto blank cassette tape. What's interesting about Sony in particular is that there was already a Supreme Court case addressing this issue for blank VHS tapes, right, for audiovisual taping of TV shows. The Supreme Court had held in a late 80s decision, um, Sony versus Betamax, uh, or sorry, Universal versus um, Sony, sometimes referred to as the Betamax case, um, that this was fair use and therefore that no infringement was found. What's interesting about this class action is that it shows that there were actually substantial questions left open by the Supreme Court's decision that needed adjudication and on a class-wide basis that would operate as effectively an extinguishing of all claims held by all um, music publishers and songwriters who believe their copyrights were being infringed by the manufacturing of blank tapes. So what I think was remarkable about the ensuing settlement in Khan um, is that the settlement didn't contain any payment to class members. Instead, the only thing it contained was a promise amongst the settling parties to support legislation for royalties on digital audio, audio recording equipment and software. So I think the resulting law is immensely interesting because it remains the only law in the US to establish a royalty system on blank tapes. And it also served as a precursor to, I think, one of the most significant sections of the Copyright Act today, which makes it illegal to circumvent digital rights management tools. You might have seen this law in the news recently um, as 
farm as farmers get really mad that their tractors are all equipped with copyrighted software and um, it is illegal to try to circumvent that software in order to make repairs on your own tractor. That particular law that's in the news today, this was the this um, particular audio home recording act law was served as the precursor and very much the model for um, section 1201. So I think another notable class action that I discuss in some depth in the paper involves an early internet service provider named CompuServe, and they ran message boards where users posted a bunch of content, including, as the plaintiffs claimed in the lawsuit, Frank, um, including copyrighted music. So what's remarkable about that litigation is that it was one of the first lawsuits to allege infringement by an online database or forum based on the activity of its users. And it was certainly the very class action to do so. So at the time that lawsuit was brought, there was a lot of uncertainty in this area. I think many internet service providers took the position that they were merely dumb pipes, right? The stuff is moving through their system, but they have no way to control what it is. And therefore, they shouldn't be liable for the activity of its users. But I think, again, the law was unsettled. And Frank attempted to argue that, no, even if you are just an internet service provider and you don't necessarily know what your users are doing, by providing them the tools to engage in posting free music, you are also liable for copyright infringement. That settled, as I discussed in the, in the, in the project, and the parties there um, agreed to enter into a licensing agreement providing for future royalties to the class of music publishers. So following that settlement, CompuServe's general counsel testified in subsequent legis um, legislative hearings that what's known as a safe harbor was necessary, um, a safe harbor providing internet service uh, providers with some limited immunity because we should treat them more like dumb pipes that don't necessarily um, know uh, all about all the infringing activity going on on their servers. So the subsequent testimony resulted in um, the passage of DMCA Section 512, uh, which provides for the safe harbor that protects um, internet service providers and platforms like Facebook and YouTube um, as we know it today, which immunizes them to a certain extent for the infringement committed by its users. So now I'm going to jump forward a few decades and talk about the Spotify litigation, which, um, I, I, you know, which I worked on during my time in private practice. Um, so when I uh, was uh, in private practice, um, Spotify, one of our clients, had been sued based on a failure to um, adequately license out all the music that was on its service. So when Spotify first launched in the United States, it went out and got a bunch of direct licenses with record labels. But actually, in every single song, there's two distinct copyrights, and they're owned by two very different parties. One is um, in the actual master recording, the recorded music, and that's owned by record labels. But the second right is the underlying musical work, the sheet music and the lyrics. Those are usually held by music publishers or individual songwriters. Um, the allegations in that case were that Spotify entered into a bunch of um, direct deals with record labels and, and even with large music publishers, but it failed to enter into licenses with all the smaller music publishers. Now, there is, in theory, a system set up by the Copyright Office that would allow you to issue what's known as a notice of intention, where you just basically ask for a compulsory license. You say, I'm going to stream this song. Um, I didn't directly engage in licensing negotiations with every single music publisher, but I want to be able to still play this song. But the issue is that that NOI process, as I describe in the paper, was really done on a work-by-work -work basis, and it simply was inadequate to keep up with the amount of works that were being streamed on a service like Spotify. So around the same time that Spotify and then its competitor services were being sued on a class action basis, um, it became a, a clear to all the parties involved, given the amount of money that was at stake and the exposure for these large companies, a lot of whom were e either public or about to go public, like Spotify, that there needed to be another solution. And so, even as we were crafting our settlement for Spotify, there was talk in Congress of passing what came to be known as the Music Modernization Act, which is one of the most significant copyright um, legislation packages we passed in well over uh, a decade. And so how we ended up crafting the Spotify settlement in which we had this monetary component where we said, okay, we're gonna have um, a blanket license to cover future uses and a blanket release for past um, infringements. 
But we also had this valuable, I think, non-monetary component where we established a mechanical licensing collective to begin the process of engaging in blanket licensing rather than work by work licensing, which is all that was available previously and to begin filling in bad data because the songwriting industry had been um, dealing with really bad data, incomplete data where the owners of the works could not be located, much like um, in the Google Books litigation with, um, with you know, published books and how the owners couldn't be located. So the industry really agreed to come together and kind of share in that, um, in that data process. And the structure of that settlement with the um, establishment of the Mechanical Licensing Collective, the non-monetary components about data sharing, and then the monetary components um, were sort of transposed onto the Music Modernization Act, which key innovation was to allow for a blanket license rather than work by work licensing for streaming. So what I think is interesting about the class action mechanism more generally, and I think which might be interesting for civil procedure scholars or those studying civil procedure, is that the settlements in these cases, in these copyright class action cases, have operated like blanket licenses. And I think a lot of procedural scholars writing about class actions have conceived it, of it either as a joinder device for deterring um, or for ensuring litigation efficiency, right? In, in which we say we have a bunch of cases pending, let's just get them all together before one judge so that we don't tax the court system. That's the joinder device litigation efficiency aspect. Or else I think civil procedure scholars typically think of class actions as a regulatory device for deterring sort of mass misconduct and for the mass processing of claims. And in that sense, the regulatory device conception um, sort of sees class actions operating in this uh, system of trying to prevent injustice, right? If we think about the typical con context of class actions, we're talking about mass torts usually, right? Asbestos cases, Agent Orange cases, um, uh, uh, tobacco cases. These are all the classic class actions pending class actions in which we're talking about how do we get individual plaintiffs some amount of relief for these horrific harms that have been done them. But I think this is actually closer to a third dimension of what a class action, in particular a class action settlement can do, which is an efficient licensing mechanism. So it's really not the same as the regulatory device conception. Um, we're not really talking about trying to address harms that uh, aren't really addressable by monetary damages. Here, we're, we're closer to saying that the age of digital aggregation and distribution in which the rise of technologies like Spotify or Google Books has really resulted in a market failure. The copyright markets were never set up to to engage in mass licensing in this way, right? There's all types of inefficiencies and transaction costs that occur when we try to engage in mass licensing. And so this is farther afield from the tort law scholarship about what class actions have done and closer to engaging, I think, with what the contract law scholars have been writing about with market failures um, and transaction costs. And it says actually litigation can, can in fact decrease transaction costs significantly by having these settlements operate as blanket licenses, right? So um, a settlement in a copyright class action or a ruling in a certified class, which is very rare, um, has the effect of licensing rights owned by and thus extinguishing claims held by hundreds of thousands of long tail copyright holders. It provides finality in a way that only potentially fair use in copyright could achieve, um, while also providing some payment to rights holders. So, um, I think I'm, I think I'll just stop there, and then uh, I will. I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions or other aspects of my paper that I didn't have time to go into um, in the Q and A. All right, thanks very much, Professor Tang. That was a very helpful uh, overview of the key issues. And for folks who read the article, I think you would agree. For those of you who did not read the article, uh, I would highly commend it. Uh, the Neither her overview nor all that we're going to discuss will do justice to the level of detail and the analysis that's gone into it, and it's well worth a read. Normally, I would say academic articles are bedtime reading, but I think this is one of the exceptions. It, it, it is quite riveting and a good um, uh, narrative of the historical development and future trends and what we can expect both from class action lawsuits and uh, its impact in the copyright sphere.
I'm going to start as a civil procedure professor today and ask you a question um, that one of the students submitted, and they were interested to find out about what impact um, class actions in copyright might have on civil procedure itself. So why don't we start there? Sure. So yeah, I think, you know, I kind of go into this a little bit in the, I think that's a good place to start because it's kind of where I concluded, right? Where I was talking about, you know, civil procedure scholarship, I think, has conceived of class actions as this either or, right? Either it's a joinder device, which I think is, um, you know, a, a sort of simplistic notion of what class actions do as just aggregating a bunch of claims and getting them before one court or as a regulatory device to deter misconduct. And so in that sense, when you think about what class on, class actions are doing as a regulatory device, um, civil procedure scholars like Judith Resnick um, and others have been really, really uh, skeptical of, of it because, um, and this is where the term judicial managerialism came about. So Professor Resnick, um, you know, speculated uh, or, or has written extensively on this idea that actually courts, so these mass class actions in the Agent Orange context, in the asbestos context, in the tobacco context, has turned courts into basically a processor of claims. So it's akin to courts as claims processors, right? Kind of like courts as administrative agencies, where um, there's some, <laughs> it's sort of a, an emergency um a, a sort of an emergency system that's been set up with the court presiding in which we say there's been this mass crisis of and you know, everyone's sick from agent orange or everyone's sick from tobacco um there's actually a pending litigation right now against johnson and johnson that i think is getting a lot of national attention i don't know if you talk about this in your civil procedure class but um basically johnson johnson is standing um uh, suit in all these class actions that's been filed around the country that's now been consolidated into a, a multi-district litigation, alleging that the talc in its baby powders has um, given a lot of women cancer over the years. So this is, you know, we think of this as like a crisis mode, and this is how civil procedure scholars have written about this. There are claims processors, and there's a lot of injustice in that situation, I think, because you think about, you know, everyone in theory gets their day in court. How can we possibly just process all these claims and give them maybe small payouts that are not really commensurate with the harm they suffered? That's a classic complaint in the tall case. We can see J&J &J trying to cap their liability here. There's a lot of interesting scholarship that's been done in this context, I think in bankruptcy, um, because they're, they've formed a sub subsidiary that now is trying to file for bankruptcy and cap their talk liability. But this is really different, I think. And so if you think if I think for those who are upset by the aggregation of claims, and the processing of them, because they are often used to process this mass injustice, this is actually a very different context. And so the reason it's a different context is because there's actually in copyright, most of the scholars come to this from the position that actually the rights holders maybe don't deserve payment. Like that's the idea is that, um, you know, these are small rights holders. Maybe their rights aren't that valuable. Maybe they should have done more to be more successful. I think this is generally the conception in copyright, right? Like is underpayment is better for the copyright system because we view copyright as a monopoly. I sort of disagree with that. I think this paper is taking a more, we think some amount of payment is okay. But more importantly, you don't have to agree with whether or not in theory, um, the individual rights holders even deserve money. So this is actually, you know, like we're moving from a world in which generally we think of um, class actions underpaying um, plaintiffs. And now we're saying maybe we've overpaid them. But I don't actually think that matters that much because what I think is also valuable is that the defendant is receiving a blanket release. And I think that blanket release is really valuable to the defendant because it's a way of carrying on business and achieving finality. So in that sense, why it's valuable to the defendant is very similar, I think, to you know why mass torts litigation and um, is valuable to the defendant. But what we're looking at is from the plaintiff side, it's actually two different very types, two very different types of plaintiffs. And that's why I say this is not about addressing injustice. This is about um, the class action mechanism serving as a blanket license to provide finality of relief. Um, and so I think it introduces a third dimension and I think makes it maybe easier for us to accept the class action context here Whereas otherwise, I think largely class actions have been, there's been so much critique that they've sustained over the years, rightly, I think. But I would say in this particular context, I'm 
optimistic that I think they represent a great middle ground to getting defendants finality from, from the cost of even being sued by idiosyncratic plaintiffs, while also providing plaintiffs, some of whom may be perfectly worthy of a payout, um, you know, some amount of payment for their works. Thanks. So let's zoom in now on the plaintiffs and the defendants. And there are two sets of questions there for plaintiffs and defendants. One question is on these little plaintiffs, uh, small time music artists or what have you, that may actually be happy to have lots of people use their stuff and would not like to be part of a class action lawsuit. Could they be pulled into one against their will? I think that was one of the, if I do justice to the way that the question was phrased, the gist of it. But also on the other side, the defendants could be pummeled into accepting terms, which they might not if they were on more even keel uh, with the other side, given the fact that class actions tend to be very large, large number of plaintiffs against usually small number of defendants. Yes, I think, you know, so I think that's absolutely right. So I'll take the first point about the plaintiffs. Um, you know, I think what, so first of all, obviously with a class, you can always opt out as the, you get the notice in the mail and you can decide, actually, I don't want to be part of the class. So I'm going to go ahead and opt out. And in the Spotify class action, for example, there were a lot of opt outs that were received. Now, what's remarkable about the opt outs is that, and maybe actually what's maybe unsurprising about the opt outs is that it's an always someone who wants more money, not no money. <laughs> it's always going to be someone who believes their work is worth more and therefore wants to individually litigate um, rather than have, you know, rather than say like, I actually am happy to just have my work used and not receive payment. So that's always going to be the case, I think. But, you know, again, the opt-out mechanism, I think, provides plaintiffs the ability to individually litigate their claims. And so obviously, you know, the opt out mechanism um, makes the overall settlement uh, value a little bit um, more tenuous for the defendant. So that gets to the second question, um, Professor Lim, that you asked me about, you know, um, in terms of the defendant, could they be pummeled into settling for something that they are not happy with? And so I think that's ultimately a business decision rather than a litigation decision about, you know, how much risk the company feels like they're taking on if they do not try to make global peace. And global peace is not a term that I came up with. This has been in the civil procedure scholarship for a long time. It's usually used in the, again, in the mass torts context about making some form of like achieving some kind of global peace for all the harms that's been done nationally or even globally. Um, in this sense, right, it's about like, you know, we're streaming, we're making it, uh, we're streaming, um, all across the US, we're making so many works available. And we just don't have the resources, A, to even engage, find every single songwriter that may have a fractional interest in these songs and try to negotiate with them one on one like a business deal. And do we have the appetite for litigation for some for people to keep popping out of the woodwork and suing? And you know, these little cases, they come up. And when they come up, if you have a settlement, and they they miss their opt out window. You say no, your, you know, your claim was extinguished by the fact that you were explicitly part of this class and you didn't opt out. Um, so I think that's really valuable to the defendant, and then they can make the business decision of, well, you know, this we're being asked to pay X millions of dollars in this settlement, is that worth it to us? Plus maybe the mo non monetary terms, and if it's not, and they and they and they choose to forego it. They can then choose, okay, do they want to try to make a fair use claim and have a global peace with no with no payment to anyone, which you know is the ideal scenario, but I think there's a lot of uncertainty there because if you go through to a fair use ruling, maybe the court will say it's not fair use, and then you open yourself up to more and more claims. Um, so they can choose, do they want to forego the settlement and try to do a winner take all where they get global peace and no payment? Or do they just say, okay, we're going to just in, continue to individually litigate, and the and the business decision of the price of individual litigation, you know, it's mostly not in terms of the damages you're paying out, but the attorney's fees, right? And a lot of times with these smaller works, it's going to be the attorney's fees that's going to out that's going to trump the actual damages that you pay to the plaintiff. What's that worth? 
to them. And you can also craft a settlement in some in a way that says like, you know, if you get too many opt outs or something or something like that before the opt out deadline, you know, then you decide actually the parties are just not going to settle. So that might be one way of doing it if you want to guard against too many opt outs. Thanks, Professor Tang. Now, you, you also mentioned fair uses loss licensing revenue model and how that could be a pitfall when you think about for fair use, because essentially, if there's a potential market for it, that should not be fair use. How does that affect your model of class license, uh, class actions and licensing? Yeah, so the lost licensing um, revenue is this uh, <clears throat> is sometimes what courts will say, well, it can't be fair use because the even the plaintiff had a licensing market for the work, which is the most important. Uh, some the, some courts will say that's the most important fair use factor is factor four, where they look at licensing markets. And because they could have licensed out their work and they didn't, then, you know, and, and they didn't because you chose to go ahead and use the work without payment, we're going to hold that it's not fair use. So I think there is definitely a concern, and that was sort of the some of the reactions to this paper from the copyright community, that um, the growth, if class action settlements were to grow in this context, that it would um, su sufficiently diminish fair use um, because you'll end up having defendants who to make to achieve global peace basically enter agree to enter into a settlement that's tantamount to a blanket license right even for uses that maybe if they had fought it all the way through a, a, a litigation on the merits they the court might find is fair so you can imagine um you know the google for example the uh the fair use case that held that when google makes thumbnails of photos available on its Google image search, it's fair use and therefore they don't need to pay a license. That wasn't styled as a class action. It was a single suit brought by a plaintiff named Perfect 10, who is a, a magazine, who said, Google, you are infringing on our copyright because when people Google um, our photos, it just shows up in Google image search, but we have actually a paywall system, but now they can just pull the thumbnail images without ever having to use our paywall and we're losing revenue. So in this case, Google argued fair use. And I think you I, I think in that case, you know, the stakes are lower because even if you lost fair use, Google would just have to pay perfect 10 some amount of money commensurate with how many works they own, which at the end of the day is not a ton when you compare it to the much greater numbers of works owned by class action plaintiffs in the aggregate, right? So they were, I think they were perfectly comfortable taking it through to a fair use finding. In that case, established the important principle that, you know, th new technological transformations of copyrighted works in the form of, for example, thumbnails can be fair. But now imagine that that was actually filed as a class action. Maybe Google would have said, oh, well, we're not going to we're not going to take the risk because if we lose fair use, the risk is too great because now we're in this world in which maybe the court is going to certify the class and then we're going to be liable to the tune of billions of dollars. So in that sense, maybe they would say we're going to settle. And when they settle, that's a blanket license, right? Because that's, you know, that's what the paper says is basically I view settlements like a blanket license. Now think about the next time that, first of all, now we're deprived of a ruling that, you know, a, a common law precedent that um, thumbnails constitute fair use. Instead, what we say is actually Google licensed that use. So it now starts to chip away at the fair use under factor four, because then it's going to turn everything into presumptive licensing instead of trying to argue that actually it's fair and people should be free to use this without paying the copyright holder. So that's why I said, you know, I think for um, where civil procedure scholars, the, the way they come to this is, are the plaintiffs getting enough? They always worry the plaintiffs are not getting enough. But if the, the common critique I had of my paper from copyright scholars was, no, the plaintiffs are getting too much. It doesn't matter. Even if they get 10 cents, we don't think they deserve 10 cents. We think this should have been adjudicated. We think this could have been adjudicated on fair use, for example. And, you know, not only are plaintiffs getting too much under your proposal, but now you're chipping away at fair use. And I think that's fair. I, I think that's a, a totally fair critique of, of my paper. Um, I, you know, I think Frankly, uh, that is a problem that is inherent with fair use doctrine overall, and it's not, it's not going to go away. Um, uh, 
you know, yesterday the Supreme Court just heard oral arguments in the Warhol case, which I don't know if some of you tuned in for that or read the transcript. It's a big case pending before the Supreme Court now about whether or not Andy Warhol um, made fair use of this photographer's image of the artist Prince. And the way that the court started that off with was by saying like, well, I, you know, why would Andy Warhol be ar able to argue fair use? We can all agree that if Martin Scorsese adapts a book, that Scorsese would have to license that use. And everyone, you know, the lawyers for Warhol all, and the lawyers obviously for the photographer and the justices all nodded and said like, yes, we agree, that would not be a fair use. And, you know, I mean, I was talking to other lawyers about this as the as the transcript was going on, we're, and we're all like, we don't agree that this wouldn't be a fair use. Yes, the industry always licenses this. Like Scorsese would, of course, pay a license to the book he's adapting, but it might still be fair. But there is a licensing practice established now, and therefore, no one in the industry argues it's it's fair. And so the reality is, unfortunately, fair use is not really often argued and relied upon for many uses that would be considered fair. Um, and so, 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 you know. so that we can say that we heard this here from you first, what is your prediction on the outcome? Is it fair or not fair? Oh, for Warhol? Yes. So I think, you know, uh, having listened to the oral arguments and read the transcript, uh, it seemed like Justice Kagan was like the most um, active member of the court and was kind of leading the charge on that. You know, I, I guess we never know, like Thomas, who obviously um, now controls the majority of the court, could throw a curveball and um, write the opinion on it because he's written IP opinions in the past for the court. But it sounded like K Justice Kagan and Justice Jackson were um, leaning towards uh, basically holding that the Second Circuit aired under factor one, under their transformative use analysis for um, the copyright folks here, um, and that they were going to send it back to uh, to the Second Circuit uh, with a with um, an instruction that they reconsider factor one because they erred in not considering meaning and message, and then to consider the, to balance it with the remaining fair use factors. By the way, I don't really think that it's going to change the outcome in the Second Circuit. I think a, a remand to the Second Circuit is still going to probably have the Second Circuit saying, okay, fine, so maybe we find that factor one actually slightly favors Warhol, which they didn't do previously. And then I'm going to get to factor four, the licensing markets factor. And again, they're going to say, we think this should have, you know, we think Goldsmith deserved a license for this. We think there's a licensing practice. We think photographers generally license their works for all types of artistic uses. And so, and then they're going to say factor four is the most important. And so therefore we still think um, Warhol loses and the photographer Goldsmith wins. That's my there, prediction. There, there are a couple of important underlying uh, themes in what you've just said, which I think is worth fleshing out for folks here. One is that personalities on the court matter. They are not just automatons. Uh, and we talked about formalism just a little while ago. I think the, the legal realist approach actually adds a lot of richness and understanding to how the law works. And just by identifying the different personalities on the Supreme Court, I think you've underscored that point well. But the other point also that so far we have talked about how the class actions can be a way not just of settling disputes but also of making law uh, and you talk about that in your article and i should mention that that section two is worth a reading just on its own uh, but you also make the point that there's another actor in the room which is congress so how does congress fit into the model that you're describing and the dynamics that you've observed with class actions? Yeah, I mean, I think a very interesting thing is, you know, the number of class actions that my research uncovered that actually resulted in subsequent legislation, right? Either explicitly, as we saw with the Audio Home Recording Act, what was remarkable about that settlement is, you know, that was premised on not monetary payment at all, but just one thing, the parties would subsequently seek follow on legislation, which they successfully got with the Audio Home Recording Act. Um, or, it, you know, it was the significant driver towards legislation, such as um, the Spotify litigation, which, you know, led to the passage of the Music Modernization Act. That was kind of what got all the parties around the table. Um, and so I think there's a couple of interesting things there. I think one is, you know, and this, I guess, is like my you know, realist view of this as well. But I think that, you know, I think 
copyright legislation in particular is driven in Congress by large, powerful interests, right? They're not going to be individuals. They're not even going to be small songwriters. They're going to be large music publishers and, and um, um, large streaming services. And class actions expose, I think, the money at stake, right? For defendants, it's the money they can, they can stand to lose if no legislation is passed. And for plaintiffs, it's or large interest, it's the money that they can stand to gain. And so even though leading the charge on the class action filed against Spotify was a smaller publisher and songwriter, as soon as that class action was filed and it seemed like it had legs, it seemed like it exposed a real crack in what was happening at Spotify, the large music publishers jumped in immediately and said like, oh, we see a problem here. And then the follow on suit started, right? Google was sued, Apple Music was sued, um, uh, 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 Rhapsody was sued, Napster, which is still in operation, I guess, was sued. So once you have that many other folks who are being sued, I think all the parties in the industry, because this is, music is a small business, I think all the parties agree that something had to be done. And so that was kind of, I think that, you know, was what led the parties to the negotiating table. Because a lot of the times that maybe the parties don't feel like negotiating for, for legislation. I think it's hard to get, get all of them galvanized in this way. And I think class actions and sort of exposing the cracks and also the immense liability that can result can actually galvanize parties towards seeking relief from Congress. So in, in your paper, you know, now article, one of the things that you talked about with respect to the Google Books case was Judge Chin says, well, this is really something for Congress. Yeah. Has anything happened in Congress since? No, so that's the, the so that's the great thing. Th thank you so much for leading me to that question, Professor Lim, because like the frustrating thing about Google Books is that orphan works has been a problem for a really long time. Orphan, you know, um, books, it, because a just, lot of them are. Yeah, just, just so that people on the call who don't know copyright and yes. follow what are often works. Yes. So books, you know, because a lot of them go out of print, um, <clears throat> then they're not tracked. And because copyright terms are so long, even a book that's out of print, maybe the, no one knows who the author is anymore or who owns the rights, right? Sometimes a lot of the times authors don't own rights. Maybe they transfer the rights to their um, to their publisher. And copyright in the US no longer requires you to register your copyright, which is so crazy because it means that there can be a copyright interest owned by someone who can just pop out of the woodwork and sue you and say, you are infringing on my copyright, even though there's actually no recorded system of their ownership interest in the copyright office's registration records that are publicly accessible. So what this means is books that go out of print stay out of print because no one knows who's the publisher, right? Maybe it was a small publisher. They went out of business. We can't find who the author is. There's no, there's nothing about them in the copyright office records because they're not required to register their copyright. Google in their books project attempted to bring back a lot of out of print books, right? We're academics, Professor Lemmy, you and I, so we you probably understand the value of having out of print books digitized for us to search because a lot of the times there's stuff we might want in an out of print book. Um, Google, however, opened it self up to immense liability by doing that because even though they couldn't find who the owner was, let alone negotiate with all these small owners, they would still be liable for copyright infringement if the owner suddenly one day decided to say, hey, you know what, I realize my book is now digitized and I don't want it digitized. There's a lot of authors who just flat out said like they didn't want their work made available to anyone, basically, right? That's so under copyright law, they would still be able to basically say um, to not only sue Google for damages, but also sue for injunctive relief. One of the injunctive relief things being shut down the Google service completely, which just seems like a crazy remedy, but that's something they could technically ask for. So, I mean, I, I, I think that it was it's such a huge problem. Google attempted to solve for it with the with the books registry, which said, OK, we're going to bring out of print books back you know, into digitization, make them publicly available. Um, as soon as the owner comes forward to claim their royalties, we have royalties in an interest bearing escrow account that we can pay out. But the court said, no, this is a matter suited for Congress. You're trying to address the orphan works problem. Well, you know, to the point of your question, no, nothing has been done. Um, it's been almost a decade since that ruling. And it's been many more decades since Congress was made aware of the problem. The Copyright Office every few years issues an orphan works report. And yet there's so much legislative gridlock that I think, you know, obviously Congress has a million priorities 
it, digitizing books, I don't know, feels like pretty far down, right? In terms of the grand scheme of things that they have to enact legislation on, but maybe to to us academics or copyright scholars, it feels like an urgent problem. So uh, on the ground, this is a bigger this is a bigger issue. Thank you. One of the questions from the students asked about European style collecting societies, well, and the, whether or not you might see something like that um, as a good replacement for class action lawsuits. Or I might add to that, could you have a collecting society in the US that's somehow administered or overseen by the USPT or the Copyright Office? Would that be a more orderly way of dealing with this transactions costs issue? Yeah, so that was a great question. Um, so the uh, so we do have collecting societies in the US, so, right? So ASCAP, BMI, the ones that I mentioned in my paper, the performing rights organizations are collecting societies, just like in Europe. And so what these collecting societies do, both here and in Europe, is um, million or hundreds of thousands of individual songwriters or other types of rights holders join and say, you know, we as individuals don't really have the time or energy to try to track every single usage of our works and get paid for them. So we're just going to outsource that to someone else who can do it. And so in the US, the collection societies, ASCAP and BMI, um, their only job is to try to track down, you know, what restaurant is playing a song and then pay, and then um, make sure that restaurant is paying a license fee to ASCAP or BMI, and then BMI pays the songwriter. Um, I think in Europe, the collection societies are a little bit more robust and well organized. Uh, I don't know if that goes to like the more, um, you know, the more individualistic mindset of American rights holders. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I, I think I definitely see class actions as a complement to private rights collectives. Uh, rather than private rights collectives completely replacing class actions or, or vice versa. And the reason is because I think, you know, as my paper discusses, some of these class actions did lead to the creation of new private rights collectives or like private public type rights hybrid collectives. And so, for example, the Mechanical Licensing Collective. And that one, I think, is interesting. It goes to your question, um, Professor Lim, about, um, you know, whether we can have the Copyright Office oversee some of this. And so the Music Modernization Act, specific within the statute said, and it provides for the establishment of a mechanical licensing collective. So it's statutorily required, but at the same time, it's mostly a private entity that has um, private governance and private, you know, members from um, private industry that sit on the board and then determine, you know, how to pay out on royalties. But the fact that it took this long and it only took a class action that led to legislation to establish the right for the private rights collective suggests that private ordering alone is not going to get us anywhere, right? The proponents of private ordering have been around for a long time. In part one of my paper, I discuss some of these proposals that have been put forth for private ordering. I talk about how Professor Rob Merges, who's at Berkeley, has since I think his article was published in the 80s or 90s, has advocated for more private rights collectives like European collection societies or like ASCAP or BMI. But yet, you know, nothing has happened, nothing has happened. Nothing was happening in 2010 when Google said, we're going to establish our own um, licensing collective in this settlement called the Book Rights Registry, right? But then that was, that failed and that no private, um, or I should say that's actually not true. So there has been a few that has sprung up after Google Books that now license out um, academic uh, publishing rights. And, and Professor Tang, do you attribute that to just the individualistic nature of Americans or something else? You know, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a collective action problem, right? Everyone agrees that something must be done, but people have a hard time getting together and actually addressing the issue without... The reason why we don't have high-speed rail between LA and San Francisco as well. Yes, exactly. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know, but all I can say is that ASCAP has been a model since it was established in the 1930s, and yet why haven't we had more? There's been more that have popped up, but I see class actions, yeah, as not a replacement for private rights organizations or private rights organizations as a replacement for class actions, but I see them kind of working in tandem and together. So you talk about techno-pessimism. This is a, a student picked up on this. You describe it as feeling 
that quote, big tech has become all imposing, all dominating, omnipotent and omnipresent. What impact, if any, will this techno pessimism have on the viability of your proposals? Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. I think that was picked up from my, uh, I have a piece that was published in Fordham Law Review last year um, called Copyrights Techno Pessimist Creep. And it is about how there's been this tech lash basically in, in Congress and in public sentiment that is looking at ways to, um, you know, I don't know. I don't want to use the word punish, but kind of rein in the power of big tech companies by making sure that they're paying equitably and all that. I definitely see this impacting class actions in the following way. So, you know, I mentioned in my, I talk about the Frank CompuServe litigation in my paper um, and say that this was filed against CompuServe before Section 512 was enacted. And Section 512 is, is the law that basically insulates um, technology companies like Facebook and Google from being sued for copyright infringements committed by its users. So if you're a user and you pop onto Facebook and decide to like live stream the entire entirety of Top Gun Maverick from the theaters as you're watching it, that's copyright infringement. But you know, people, but the Paramount Studios who produced Top Gun can't sue Facebook for it. Um, because Facebook is insulated because they're a tech platform and they in theory don't really know what the users are doing. There's call, been calls to roll that back on the idea that Section 512 has enabled technology companies to get rich at the hands of individual creators. Um, as some of you may be aware, there's calls to roll back Section 230 in Congress, which is sort of the same thing for tech companies, except for other types of non-copyrighted content. So insulating tech companies um, from someone, for example, posting child pornography on the, uh, using their servers, right? That would be um, shielded under Section 230, but there's been calls in Congress to roll that back. So if Section 512 goes the way of Section 230, which is um, a severe rolling back of its protections, which Europe has already done. So Europe already got away, done, it pretty much did away with safe harbor protection for tech companies under the same kind of like techno pessimist sentiment. If that goes away, what you're going to see is, is more liability for tech companies. And that's a, that's a huge problem because the thing that characterizes new technologies, which you know I, I kind of try to drill in on in the paper, is it's disseminating more types of content by more copyright owners than ever before, right? Never before has there been a moment in time in which um, a technology has been able to aggregate so many little rights, so many little songs, and make them available. What I call in the paper the long tail, and that's not my term. I should say it's so other people's term. Technologists writing about this say the great thing about new technologies is, you know, it's no longer just the large movie studios who can control what's being seen. Now everyone's a creator, um, and everyone can put their movie out there. That's great in the sense that we diversify content, but it's really bad from a copyright infringement perspective because it also means everyone's a copyright owner, and any dissemination of that content makes it into a copyright infringement. So Section 512, the safe harbor, insulates tech companies from a lot of that now. But if that gets rolled back, there's going to be wide exposure. How do tech companies address that exposure? Class actions might be one way for them to achieve some kind of finality, making sure they don't, they aren't sued every second by every potential rights holder. Thank you. And I can say I definitely heard this here first. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But I have more questions for you, as you know, about just technology and civil procedure generally, as well as advice for law students. But I also want to open up the floor uh, for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you and then you can ask the question, whether you are one of our students or you are one of the folks um, from outside who have joined us or one of our colleagues. I see a couple of my colleagues on this call as well. So. Feel free to raise your hand, uh, Professor Tang, has, and I have covered quite a bit in the last uh, nearly hour or so. Any questions before, I'll open up uh, the floor for questions one more time before we close. And sometimes people need a bit of time to build up momentum. So, okay, while people are thinking about their questions, I'll, I'll ask you this question, which seems to be a very popular one. We've had um, students ask this question a number of times, and I think the answer has always been slightly different. We'll see what your take on this is. Can AI be used for class certification? Is that a viable option? Um, you know, people love to introduce the AI angle to everything. Um, 
I don't know. And I guess my answer would be maybe in the same sense that AI can solve all the world's problems. So sure. I mean, I think um, uh, maybe in the sense that it would make the processing of individual um, variations much easier. <laughs> maybe there would be some future universe in which we rewrite the rules of Rule 23 to say that there are, remain no individually tribal issues because an AI is basically the judge. So I'm sure there's been work done on this. It's not really my field of specialty whether like there can, I think people have written about AI judges and the like and things like that. So in the sense that if the AI can act as a judge in that way and um, you know individually try a bunch of issues, then maybe you would be able to aggregate more claims um, and not have that be a, a barrier to Rule 23 certification. But that's just an off the cuff answer because I think it's I think it's always tough with with AI. Is, is there anything about Rule 23 that you might change? That happens also to be one of the questions from the students. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really hard question because I think with Rule 23, um, it applies in so much more context than just the copyright context. And I think as I sort of alluded to when talking about mass torts, you know, I think there's some real serious issues with how Rule 23 is applied in the mass torts context. So um, actually a colleague of mine is doing did an empirical study about um, about class actions in the UK and noted that in the UK, they are actually more um, it's not comparative, but he just noted that in the UK, class actions are more effective at increasing the evaluation of public companies or securities class actions are. So, um, but the UK system is different in the sense that, for example, their system actually require, it's, it's an opt-in procedure instead of an opt-out. And so I think my answer would be, you know, rule 23 opt-in sounds great for other types of, of claims in which we might, find that the opt-out procedure simply does great injustice to victims who've suffered from tobacco um, cancer, for example. But I think that in the copyright context, there's serious issues with turning it into an opt-in. So I mean, I think, I think the circumstances differ so much in the copyright context that I'm not really sure if um, my general feelings about how Rule 23 could be made more rigorous, um, or honestly, if there can be some kind of um, for example, prohibition on attorneys taking contingency fees might be one or a cap on how much attorney's fees are recoverable because I think attorney's fees are a huge issue. That might be one actual um, proposal that would apply equally across all types of class actions, even in the copyright context. While other ideas that I think are good in theory, like the opt-in versus opt-out, maybe not so great in the copyright context. Thanks. Certainly any student of civil procedure would have been uh, awed and intimidated by the sheer length of Rule 23. And uh, certainly simplification would help. Uh, when you talk about opt-in and opt-out, that also raises interesting questions about you know, behavioral economics and how uh, that tool may exacerbate some of the problems that you just described. Now, talking about um, the skepticism, you mentioned skepticism by courts about the, the quasi or quasi legislative nature of class action settlements. Is, is that going to, you think, um, impede the use of class action settlements, whether it's in the copyright space or more broadly um, from becoming an effective way of reform and, and um, settling disputes? Um, yeah, I think that, you know, I think judges are actually influenced, believe it or not, in some part, or maybe I like to think this because I think we play some outsized influence when we don't, but they're in influenced by academics and academic support. I mean, I, Judge Chin in the Google Books case cited a, in large part from a brief that was filed by Professor Pamela Samuelson at Berkeley, who's a copyright scholar, about um, why she believed the Google Book settlement should not have been um, approved. And so he cited a lot from that. Um, I think because she was very concerned about the quasi legislative nature of, of class action settlements. Um, so she, she and I have talked about this and I think maybe we agree to disagree, but, um, but um, you know, I think that if there is more advocacy of class actions in this particular context, 
I, I hope that it might sway, you know, even those filing amicus briefs to maybe take a different position. And those amicus briefs in turn affect courts. And so I think, I don't think what, what judges are doing, they're doing in a vacuum. They obviously do in connection with the types of briefing and the types of support they can find for their position. Um, and so I'm hopeful that, you know, putting forth this idea that, hey, this is actually not you know, because I think all the all the scholarship um, and public commentary about the Google Book settlement was quite negative at the time. Some scholars even claim that it was um, the the release that it contained for past harms was completely unprecedented and unique, and that's actually not true. So um, I, I do think, hopefully, that you know, taking a long view, a historical view of this is not some unique moment in time where the parties are asking you to do this, but this happened a lot in the past and. You know, and there have been successful approvals of this. I think will go a long way, and at least, at the very least, I'm hopeful that the next briefs that lawyers file in, in support of a, um, a a settlement approval might find my research, my historical research, helpful in pointing to these older settlements that have been approved. Thank you. Yeah, so, certainly taking the long view. Reading your article, you seem optimistic that this is only going to become more prevalent as I suppose you see in passes elsewhere in Congress and people recognize the uh, effective way of having too large groups of people come together and find a solution. Uh, I'm going to once again open up the floor for questions before we move on to that final section, uh, which is advice for law students. And if you prefer, you can also use the chat function to uh, put your question in. For Professor Tang. Any questions from the students or from our guests? Yes, I see a raised hand from Maddie. Maddie? Hi, so I had a question. Um, I've been you want to introduce yourself. Oh, <laughs> I'm Madison. I'm a 1L. Okay. I'm in I'm Professor Lim's class. So um, I've been pondering about this um, since you mentioned it. You talked about how, like, you know, the benefits of the technological platforms is that um, basically it's producing more content creators. However, it does give everyone um, or like more people the copyright. Mm -hmm. um, so what would be like a um, basically like a balance or a remedy to that issue? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that uh, I do think that class actions could be a balance or remedy to that issue. Right. So um the the class action cases i talk about the more recent ones the more recent ones are about um uh you know streaming songs which are some of them which may already be owned by people who are not a, not a traditional creator but like a creator who just recorded it on garage band but you could totally see something um in which you know, currently, I think if you post a video to Instagram, you grant Instagram a non-exclusive license to just reproduce it. So you're basically saying, yeah, I know I own the copyright, but I give you a license. You could see a class action suit in which actually one lead plaintiff who is a creator on Instagram says, I find this term in your term of service unconscionable. Why would we, by just agreeing to use the platform, give you away or something that's really valuable to us, which is our copyright? So if it's done on behalf of a class, that one creator who might be really powerful and have a ton of followers can actually represent a class of smaller creators who are maybe starting out and, you know, find it very unfair that they're granting Instagram a license, right, to reproduce their copyrighted video. Um, and so in that case, then you would have a class action, you'd be swept into this class and you would get some kind of monetary payment and at least acknowledge, and, some, and you would be swept into the non-monetary Pay, uh, provisions of that settlement if there were any. So maybe Instagram, for example, would agree. It's going to change its terms of service and it's not going to make you give them a license, an automatic license to your copyrighted work anymore. That would, I think, be an outcome that a lot of creators would be very happy with. Thank you, Professor Tang. Now, I want to make sure that we have enough time for advice to law students. And I know you also to talk about advice to law students after graduation. Now, reading the questions that you that I received on your behalf, it all reads almost like fan mail. They certainly went through and uh, you left a lot of admirers here. Yeah. They talked about your background, uh, your writing background, journalism, reporting, creative writing, English literature, 
um, and asks, they're interested to know uh, two aspects. Well, one, how has that helped you in law school? And what would you advise uh, people who are interested in writing at scholarship? Um, you know, I think, I, I think that being a creative writing major and English major automatically set me up to, you know, be interested in writing and in the written word. And so I actually enjoy writing legal scholarship. Um, you know, I think as an English major, you were doing a lot of writing already in college, writing papers that maybe analyzed, um, you know, a, a particular book, for example. And so I find that writing legal scholarship is similar in the way that you are really pulling together a lot of sources of literature, like legal legal literature that exists. And your job is to synthesize that, which is a skill that I think as an English major, um, you're, you're taught. And so um, I, I tend to think that it helps with the writing. And I think that a legal law review, a legal article that flows really well, and is well written, um, has a lot of power. I mean, you know, law professors come from all different types of backgrounds, um, people who are writing legal scholarship might might be a STEM major, and might have been a STEM major. And in that sense, you can sometimes see, right? Like um, my my style is not for everyone in the way that I write my articles. Sometimes you will say, okay, it's too flashy or it reads like a magazine article because you know I came from an editorial background because um, I used to work at a blog as well. So it's not for everyone, but other people really like it and say, I love the way it flows. It reads really well, it reads fast. Um, and so I would say that, you know, find your own personal writing style, but certainly I think, I know a lot of folks end up in law school from liberal arts backgrounds. Um, and I think it's an asset to, to, to being a lawyer and to being able to write persuasively. Thank you. And why don't we just segue into the career advice that you had in mind at the start of the call? Sure. Yeah, I think there was a question about, you know, as a 1L, um, you're trying to figure out what you're gonna do uh, where you're going to land, whether you're going to be in big law or in house and some of the advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, and I would say, you know, I think that a lot of people start their career at a law firm and then end up going in house. I think it's pretty rare to land an in house job right away after graduating. Um, it's much it's it's much more common to work for a few years at a law firm and then go in house. Um, and you know, it's in-house is not for everyone. I think that it's um, it's you have more control of your schedule in-house. I think it's the hours are more predictable. People are kind of working like a nine to five job. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of uh, there there is a lot of you know. I think a, a lot of people prefer being at a law firm because you're tackling you know more. Um, high octane cases, more high stakes litigation, high stakes deal work that involves a lot of complex, um, you know, analysis and thought. And certainly when I was in house, I found that the everyday questions that were sort of more repetitive and that I easy and no brainers, I would answer. Whereas obviously if there was something very, very high value and high stakes, it was the type of stuff that I would have in theory liked to work on, but I had to pass it off to outside counsel. So those are the considerations, you know, like a better work life balance, but maybe not as um, intellectually stimulating of, of work. Of course, every in-house job is different. So that's just a generalization, but that's the general, I, you know, thing that I think is pretty common when you hear from folks who've been at both law firms and in-house. I see a, a question for Professor Tang from my colleague, Tom Lee. Uh, and I think you can see it too, but I'll just read it. Who will have the final say in a hybrid public-private licensing scheme in the U.S. or a global level as this space evolves, the courts, a specific regulatory body, etc.? cetera? Um, thank you so much for that question, Professor Lee. Uh, I think it's a great question. You know, I think that the great thing about um, class actions and why I call them a public-private licensing scheme is because it operates like a private license in that first, the initial settlement agreement is crafted by the parties to the settlement. So that's just like a license agreement. You sit down and you say, what do I want and how much am I willing to pay for it? But then it has to undergo court approval. And so in that sense, it's public because it's overseen by um, a judicial body, uh, a court, a district court really overseeing the settlement. And then obviously subject to appellate review um, that 
has to actually agree that the settlement um, could be approved. And even if, you know, the district court agrees, maybe it doesn't, maybe the sec, maybe the appellate court doesn't agree. So I think, I think, um, you know, it has that, it has that extra layer of public oversight on top of the fact that a lot of these settlements do lead to legislative action. And so then you also have congressional action, which some people prefer over judicial action because they believe it's a better representation of um, the democratic polity, which, you know, it, it may or may not be true. Um, certainly I think in copyright, was. there's a lot of industry capture, right? In copyright um, uh, lawmaking, but in theory, yes, like the classic idea is that legislatures are a better embodiment of um, democratic rulemaking. And so in that sense, then you also have that element. So I think it's, um, you know, in theory, courts have the final say, so to speak, but then you also, it, depending on what the settlement ends up doing, it might also, it might be that the legislation has the final word on, on what is permissible and applies to a much broader number of parties than just the independent settlement between the two parties to the litigation. Thank you. Last call for questions. We had a couple of good questions too. And of, of course, the students who submitted your questions, I uh, hope we got to all of them and you heard the answers that you were looking for. I do have one final question for you. And that's if folks want to follow your work, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Do you have a website? Is there somewhere where they can subscribe to alerts? Um, that's such a great question. I wish I, I don't know, Professor, Professor Lim, do you have, how, can I, because I actually don't have, I'm I don't receive fan mail, so I, <laughs> I have to work harder to, to establish my fan base first. <laughs> I mean, I wish I used Twitter. I'm like really bad at using Twitter. Um, so I think my SSRN page is where I post all the scholarship that is ready to be um, you know, read and that it's past rough draft form. So that's probably the best space is my SSRN page. Okay. And, and can they follow you on Twitter? Or some yes, other? absolutely. Even though I, um, you know, I don't check it that often and I don't post on it that often, but I do, um, I do try to remember to post articles that I have coming out on there. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And we're almost at time. So perfect. Uh, it's been a very enlightening tour of class action lawsuits and copyright, I think for the one else, it gives them an opportunity to think about how what they've studied relates to uh, something that they could study uh, in the coming year. And for the rest of us, I think I speak for everybody that we all learn a lot. So thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. And we look forward to your next work, Professor Tang. Thank you so much for having me, Professor Lim. And it was really a pleasure getting to speak with all of you and receive all your wonderful questions. Thank you. All right. Tune in next time for our, our next event. Thank you very much.